it's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey, everybody, and welcome. It's Chrissy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here, and this is episode number 42 of our podcast, where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens. More chickens. We drink a ton of coffee. I'm talking a ton, but most importantly... We hug chickens every day. And kiss them, too. Don't forget. We brew coffee from a little coffee house here in Bel Air, Maryland. Coffee, coffee. Holly Ann, what kind of coffee are we brewing today? French roast. Oh, yeah. French is strong. Yeah. (laughs) If you're a fan of delicious coffee, scrumptious scones, and fabulous lunchtime specials, and your local, head on over to Coffee Coffee. You will not be disappointed. Hello there. Hello. How are you doing? Great. I was just looking at the date. Uh Uh-huh. In less than a month, we'll be a year working on this. Actually, we're already past a year because we were working on it in the summer before we launched anything. We were, right. But we're coming up on our year date of launching all of our social medias. The launch of our launch. The (laughs) pre-launch. Yeah. Yeah. This year has flown by. I can't believe. It's gone by super fast. I read these episode numbers and I'm like, we're 42? Yeah. Really? Yep. It's crazy. It is crazy. It's been a great way to spend all of our Fridays. Mm -hmm. We're going to be working harder on other days because all the kids are going to be in school. Right. We have some new projects coming up, so that'll be fun. It's going to be fun and exciting. So what's been going on at your house? Landscaper removed all the shrubs from the front of my house. Oh, yeah. Which made me do a happy dance. I love the picture you sent. Yeah. It looked like a different place. It does. It's a blank slate, and I can plant the front gardens the way I want them, and so that's super exciting. Our other fun thing, when this episode drops... My nankin chicks will be eight weeks old. Right. Right now they're six weeks old. And at least one of the cockerels is growing. <laughs> That's at six so weeks. Early. Yeah. And it's funny because back when we did the bonus episode from the Maryland poultry swap, yeah. we laughed about the Fayumi cockerels oh, yeah. growing at five and six weeks. Oh, yeah. Well, guess what? Oh, yeah. The nankins are. And it's hilarious. I'm sure it's funny. It's got to be tiny. And they're bantam, so they're tiny. Yes. And then coming, a little crow coming out has got to be hilarious. It it took me several days to realize it was a crow. I thought they were fighting because it sounds like... It sounds like a horse. It's awful. (laughs) I mean, it's hilarious, but it's awful at the same time. Yeah. So I wanted to take a second just to thank everybody for all the well wishes for Gertie. She was staying with Ann Holly, thank goodness, and had to have a second crop emergency surgery while I was away about a month ago. Right. She's on her long road recovery. Thank you to Dr. Rebecca for everything. And she has a long road ahead of her, but she's doing really well. She's doing great. She looks great. She can't be down on anything substrate wise. Nothing. She'll try to eat whatever and she can't eat anything fibrous. She can't have it. She can only have her liquid food basically until that muscle is stronger and she can push it through. Mm -hmm. She does love the liquid diet though. She bites at it. Yeah. Like, I want more. But she's (laughs) loving the stroller. The stroller was the best the buy stroller. ever. <laughs> the stroller is ridiculous. She puts her head up so high when we walk around the neighborhood. She loves it. She looks all around. She's looking around like, oh, my God, look at me. I'm being pushed by this crazy chicken lady. And it's the only way to get her out and about. Right. When she was with us during recovery, Pete would carry her around so she could see all the farm animals. Yeah. But I think she's really enjoying her walks with you. Yeah. And I just push her around. And then she gets a little angry when she sees the run. Like, I want to go in there. Oh, but Yeah. We all know she will eat herself she back will. into I mean, oblivion. Pro- we are protecting her from herself at this point. Yeah, for sure. So thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. So I'm going to take a second just to ask a favor of everybody. If you're listening to our show and loving it, if you could do us a big favor, head on over to Apple Podcast and leave us a written review. It is amazing. It does wonderful things for our show. It really does help the podcast grow. The other thing you can do to support the podcast is go to our Etsy shop, buy some of our merchandise. Our t-shirts ship free. And they're really pretty. Yeah. We also have a Patreon page, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. You can head over there, see some of the benefits you get from becoming a patron of the show. It's fun. And the other thing you can do is buy from our sponsors. Yay. We have some exciting news to share from our sponsor, Grubly Farms. From now until the end of September, you can receive 25% off if you're a first-time buyer. We have a special discount code for our listeners, CWTCL25, for 25% off your first purchase. You can follow the link in our show notes. This offer does not apply to subscriptions and cannot combine with any other discounts. If you haven't heard, 
Grubly Farms has a brand new layer of Crumbles food packed with plant and insect protein, perfect for those picky chickens and ducks. Plus, they're the perfect size for bantams and all products ship free. It's a great time to try Grubly Farms if you haven't yet. Use the code CWTCL25. Try it today. Okay, so I think it's that time. Da-da, 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 da-da. Breed a spotlight. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Were you bringing us into Italy with that? Yes! Okay. That lovely piece of music. <laughs> this week's breed spotlight is the Ancona. And they're from Italy. We actually, we ended up with an Italian chicken and an Italian recipe again this week. We sometimes do plan this stuff. Good stuff. We didn't plan this one. It, <laughs> just, it just happened. It just happened. The Ancona is a lovely chicken. And it's really cute. They really are. And they're quite an old breed. They most likely originated in central Italy. Right. And they were exported through the port city of Ancona. So that's where the name I came mean, from. I mean, if you look up Ancona, the first thing that comes up is the city of Italy. Right. Versus the chicken. So Right. And we've learned this along the way that older breeds, heritage breeds, are named after the city or the town that they originated from. Or were they exported. Right. Like in the case of the Hamburg. Right. So these names, they'll sound very familiar because they're a city or a town. Exactly. It's a region. It's a town. Something like that. So the Ancona is another beautiful example of the Mediterranean group. They are. Those Italians are beautiful, man. The Ancona also happens to be one of our favorite things, a spangled chicken. Yes. We love the spangled chicken. I mean, spangled, speckled, splash. All the above, (laughs) right? (laughs) We love them all. Dots and splashes. We love all the chickens. We do. The Ancona is a heritage breed, and they're currently on the Livestock Conservancy's watch list. Really? Yeah. Maybe because the popular breed in Italy is the Leghorn. Yeah, right. So, I mean, they might be a little shadowed by the Leghorn, but they're really beautiful chickens. They're gorgeous chickens. The Ancona arrived first in England, and then in 1888, they were imported into the U.S., the single comb Ancona was admitted to the American Poultry Association Standard of Perfection in 1898. Okay, so they've been around a while. Right. There's also a rose comb, and that was admitted to the Standard of Perfection in 1914. And they are, of course, in the Mediterranean class. So what are the things that we already are going to know about this chicken? It's going to be a small body chicken. Most likely, right? With an upright tail. Yes. And lay lots of eggs. Yes. And they all have pearly rings. That's right. Because the Mediterranean breeds all have the same characteristics. As you said, small body chicken. They're roughly the same size as their cousins, the leghorns. The hens weigh about four and a half pounds. Roosters about six. We've talked before about small area chicken keeping. Right. Chickens that can live in a smaller space. This would be one that would be great. You For know, an urban chicken keeper. Urban chicken keeper. Yeah. I had the same thought. Because you're keeping chickens. Why? Because you want eggs usually. Right. And they're smaller. Right. And they're quite layers. Right. They do pretty well in confinement, but the only thing is they like to go out and forage. Well, we'll talk about that a little more as we go along. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I agree with you 100%. I think urban chicken keepers would really love this chicken. Yes, agreed. The American Poultry Association Standard of Perfection notes that the Ancona is likely closely related to the Leghorn, though they do have several physical differences. Something about the angle of the back and the length of the back. I can see a little difference there. Yeah. They're yeah. shaped more like a regular hen than the leghorn. If you're familiar with the leghorn silhouette and then you look at the Ancona, you can see that difference. They're yeah. a little chubbier. The Ancona has a black body with white spangles on the end of their feathers. They have bright yellow legs that are sometimes mottled, so mm-hmm. you'll see some splash on their legs. Yeah. They have the beautiful white earlobes. And a big comb. And as we mentioned, either the straight or the rose comb. Yeah. The straight combed hens often have that adorable flop over comb. Yeah. Love it. The white spangles are found on, it's supposed to be every third feather or every fifth feather. Right. Honestly, I didn't have this clear in my mind, but there are accepted patterns for how the modeling shows up. I believe the modeling across the board with every molt, they become more modeled. I'm not sure if that's the case with the Ancona or not, but I most, know, like, generally that's the, the case. The speckled Sussex, the Swedish flower, I was all of that. something about the Ancona that said as they have molts, they'll become more mottled. Okay. Some yep. of the chickens you see pictures of, yeah. you see a lot more black. They might be a younger chicken. That's possible. Some are really white and black. Right. So I don't know if that's an older chicken or not. We'll have to check into that. We'll check into it. And apparently there are both blue and red non-APA standard varieties of Ancona as well, which are probably both beautiful. Oh, I'm sure. 
They are excellent layers of white eggs, about five a week. Would not expect anything less of the cousin of the lay form. Exactly. And the hens rarely go broody. Again, Again Mediterranean <laughs> right. chicken. This is the thing that we've learned across the board researching chickens is according to where they're from, most chickens in that area, even different breeds, have a lot of the same characteristics. That's what the Italians were selecting for. They were selecting right. for good laying that was uninterrupted by a broody period. In Italy, some areas are really warm. Right. They're not cold hardy. Yep. And they're monster layers. Why? Because everything that pasta is made of is eggs and flour. Yeah, there's a lot of egg consumption. Yeah. So. so they wanted a big egg production chicken. Interestingly enough, the Ancona is reputed to be a better winter layer than the Leghorn. Okay. They're supposed to be more winter hardy and less heat tolerant. Though we didn't find any firsthand information about that, just anecdotes that people had made. So if you have Anconas, you can let us know your experience, heat hardy versus cold hardy. Even if they're cold hardy, they will still need some protection from frostbite because of those combs. Anytime you have a large comb, you definitely need to do some protection. Right. It's a frostbite risk. So that frostbite. means coating combs and waddles if it's going to be a light frost. If it's severe cold, you might want to invest in something like a cozy coop heater. Right. I know for Lucy, she gets herself her own little heaters in between everybody else. I know she inserts herself between the two fluffiest <laughs> hens in that coop. It's really cute. Yeah. Her so head she's up. like, I got my own heaters going on. She does. So here's the other thing. They do really well in mixed flocks. Yeah. I saw that in numerous places. Which is really good. This is the thing that we're saying. Research these breeds before bringing them into your existing flock. Right. You want a chicken that says on a lot of things that you look up and listen to, does great in a mixed flock. Yeah, unless you're planning to keep a single breed flock, whether you're breeding or for some other reason, right. you definitely want someone who's going to get along with all the other hens. They're also very chatty and talkative, which we love. They can be flighty when startled, but everyone that I chatted with about Anconas told me that if you put the time in with them, they will bond with their caretakers and they can be quite friendly once they know you. Get out what you put in. Exactly. I was very scared when I got Lucy, and I keep going back to Lucy only because that's what I have. Okay. You bought Lucy, and you weren't even home. You called me in the car, and you were like, I, I just bought a leghorn. <laughs> I mean, everything was out, you know, like the reputation of this chicken. Like, right. And she's the one driving in the car with me. Oh, she's a fantastic chicken. So it is what you put in, you get out. These are really cute little chickens. They're adorable. I love them. They're active and excellent foragers, but they still handle confinement relatively well. That's why I was saying for urban chicken keepers. Yeah, I do think this will be a great breed. You could have a few more than you could have, say, a buff orping. Right. And they're going to give you five eggs versus three. So if you're looking for food security in a smaller urban space, you can't go wrong with the Ancona. And they're pretty. And they're beautiful birds. They really are. So they kind of check off all the boxes, except for cold hardy you just have to do some extra protection. Right. And if you want a setter, you're going to want a different breed because your Anconas are not uh, going to hatch like, eggs for you. Ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll loan you a Nankin. <laughs> so, again, we think they would make an excellent addition to a layer flock, a pet flock, or they'd even be a good homestead breed if you wanted to go that route. Oh, yeah, for sure. You would just either need to hatch with an incubator or a broody hen if you decided to breed. Now, these chicks are available through most of the major hatcheries. Yeah, I was surprised at how readily available they are. You don't think of them as readily available because the feed supply stores don't get them as I've often. I've never seen an Ancona in any of our local feed stores. No. so Because I would have bought it. Sometimes you wonder, like sometimes I want the feed supply stores to get different types of chickens. Uh -huh. And it's just whatever the hatcheries can give them yeah, involved. I guess so. I don't know if you remember back in February when we were planning this year's chick purchase, I considered the Ancona. Yeah, you did. That will be one in your flock. Down the line. Down the line. <laughs> so if you're looking for smaller numbers, you can order from my pet chicken. Yes. I think three is our magic number. Generally, yeah. yeah. I think it depends on your zip code. But yeah, I think once it warms up, they will send you three chicks. Yeah. You can also check the Livestock Conservancy's Breeders Directory for breeders near you. And you can go on social media and see if there's any groups. Absolutely. Look around. Hey, Chris. Yeah. Do you like subscription boxes? Does that have anything to do with chickens? Of course. Then yes, let me just take a minute to tell everybody about the Chicken Love Box. If you love goodies for your chickens and you, you need to go to chickenlove.com. I love the Mega Box. There are tons of useful products for my flock and a chicken tea for me. You cannot go wrong with these chicken teas. They are so cute and so soft. In the August box, I absolutely love the copper chicken earrings and the blood stop powder. They're very shiny. I love the coin purse. It's quilted and it's going to be a 
great tote for my lip gloss. Boxes start at $39 a month. They ship immediately after your order and shipping is always free. It's such a great deal. Don't wait. Get off the nest and click already. That's chickenlove.com. That's chickenluv.com. Get your subscription today. Okay, so now it's time for our main topic. And our main topic today is one that I know a lot of ladies out there are going to really love to listen to because it's chicken lady history. It's the history of all of us. This is a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun putting this together. So we're going to do an overview. We're not going into from the start of time. No, not super detailed. I mean, that's really hard to say, but I'm sure from the start of time, there was. We know there were several thousand years of chickens. (laughs) Yeah. So really, we're going to stick mostly with the U.S. and U.K., the Western world, because as a historian, those are my areas of expertise. Right. And also because we don't have that much time on the show. And what's going to become clear are these historical patterns. Right. This topic is actually near and dear to our hearts. It is. We do love the history. Because we are the chicken ladies. We are all chicken ladies. And we wanted to know. If you're a man, you can be a chicken lady too if you want to. Or you can be a chicken (laughs) dude. You can be a chicken dude. (laughs) You can be a chicken man. Yeah, chicken man. So here in the U.S. and also in the U.K., until about the Mm mid-1800s, chickens and other poultry were almost exclusively the responsibility of the women. And this is because the men believed that the bigger livestock could not be handled by the women. So the women took over the chicken. I think that the thought was the chickens weren't worth as much as the bigger livestock. And so they just sort of left them to the women. That's kind of what I meant. But yeah. I mean, basically, they took over everything else and said, take your chickens. Right. And so what you find is that estate notes, things like that, letters, correspondence, where the landowners, which were mostly men, were, were writing all of these things, they would tell you how many goats they had, how many sheep they had, how many cattle. They would tell you how many pounds of wool they got when they sheared their sheep, but they won't mention the poultry. No, and where we would find these types of things were in ladies' journals, ladies' correspondence. <clears throat> they would be talking about the chickens and the poultry. Right. So we're back in the mid-1800s. Sometimes children would be recruited to help, which makes sense. You Still know. in this day. Exactly. Yes. You get the kids to help. But it was generally the woman of the house who made all the decisions regarding the chickens, the geese, ducks, eggs, etc. All the poultry. So there are exceptions to any rule, including this one, but there's tons of evidence to support our claim that the chicken lady is a bona fide historical phenomenon. It is a real thing. It is. I mean, we even know it from going back in time, like right. looking at other things. One of those points in history that's considered a turning point is the Black Plague in England, which oh was around 1400, right? Yeah. Good times, good times. <laughs> kind of like now. Yeah. So there are various written sources that note that both peasant women and wealthier women of the gentry had charge of the household chickens. You didn't find a lot of correspondence then, but you found mentions. I would think that the higher society women would have phantoms and... Yes, you're right. They would have standard-sized chickens just for eating eggs, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And they would keep the bantams. And in England, it included our nadkins. As pets. As pets to hatch eggs. The gentlemen of the estate would use something like a nankin hen to hatch their pheasants, their right. sport birds. Right. And we're only going to mention this once because it's unspeakably horrible, also to raise their fighting birds. So according to a 2009 Yale University paper, the ladies of the estates, the wealthier women, oversaw the poultry. So it was their concern. Exactly. You know, they, they supervised. But the actual work, they would send their dairy maids out to do it. Right. So she would have to milk the cows, make the Mm -hmm. butter, make the cheese. She also had to feed the chickens and then supervise them the whole time they free ranged. Real live Cinderella. Absolutely. I hope dairy maids were well paid. Dairy maids. That's a lot of work. Did they get a portion, a percentage of the eggs laid? Something here. I don't know. I think they probably not only were paid, unless they were very local, they probably lived on the estate too, Mm -hmm. near room and board. So we're going to fast forward a few hundred years now to the 17th and 18th century. So 16, 1700s, and we're going to visit the young United States. Yeah, and there are a lot of chickens. Chickens were all over the place by this time. Yeah. And while they still weren't considered actual livestock by all those male mm-hmm. owners and stewards, they were found in the yards of almost everyone. Mm-hmm. And we know that from correspondence that Thomas Jefferson did keep chickens. He did keep bantams. Yep. And we know George Washington, when he married Martha, He had his steward stock the estate's poultry yard with chickens for her. I think we mentioned this back on our 4th of July episode. Episode 31, yeah. That when we were talking about all that stuff, that was one of my favorite episodes. Because we got to go to Mount Vernon. And that definitely was true. He needed to bring in some chickens for Martha. Yeah. There were no chickens there for her at that point. 
the enslaved people who live on the estate probably kept most of the poultry and they would have been able to sell it back to the estate. We'll talk about that a little more in a minute here. So in the 19th century, again, we're talking mid-1800s there, before and after the Civil War, essentially. Right. If you went to England and you were a woman of middle or upper class, you would find actual books that were housekeeping manuals telling you how to keep house. I think they kind of still have those. Kind of. They're magazines now. Good housekeeping. Exactly. Right. (laughs) I mean, I think that's how that whole magazine started. Probably, yeah. And it's evolved over the years. Yes. Just to be the woman's magazine that it is. But even with the name of good housekeeping. Exactly. Oh, out of Better Homes and Gardens. All of those. I think they evolved out of that. They were a more modern version. And they're geared towards women. Yes. So if you Google these housekeeping books... Some of them are just full of recipes. Mm -hmm. Others have recipes for laundry detergents, things like that. Some of them, you find articles or essays in the book recommending that women keep chickens to earn some money of their own. Hey, they had to do something to get some money. So by this point in time, women in both the U.S. and the U.K. had started selling eggs. They would sell pullets you know, young chickens to people who wanted more chickens. Right. And feathers. And the feathers were used for pillows, which I know you love. Well, I am always like molting. We need to take these feathers right. and reuse them. So they would sell feathers for pillows. And also things like shed rooster tails would go for like oh. hat making. Oh, yeah. work. And the results of all this, they called egg money. Yeah. It's still called that it's now. It's still called egg money. Right. I mean, honestly, the whole history of the chicken lady has not gone too far. It really hasn't. When you Some look things at things are really the same. When you look at the numbers, more women are drawn to chickens than men. Yep. I'm not going to take anything away from the chicken man out there. But right. statistics show us that more women own chickens yes. way more than yes. men. Do the children help? Heck yes. We're going to make those kids help. If you help. can get them, absolutely. And you want to make egg money? Me, I like giving them to the neighbors and my friends. Right. Joe's always telling me, sell the eggs, sell the eggs. And I'm like, I can't. I give some, I sell some. Yeah. It depends. Yeah. yeah. So we also mentioned earlier that enslaved people on large estates were usually permitted to keep chickens and sell both eggs and meat back to the estate. Yeah. That's another egg money phenomenon. Yeah. Okay. So how did we get from this wonderful chicken lady land to where we are now? Hen fever. Hen fever. And again, you look at it. It parallels modern day. Uh huh. Look at the royals in England. Right. They can start a trend just by wearing something. <laughs> and we look at the same as what happened back then. Queen Victoria. Right. She had her chickens, her cochin, her Brahma. Yes. And everybody had to have the cochin and the Brahma. Right. And it became hen fever. That's what it was called. And it was essentially the advent of the chicken show and the hen fever. So that got menfolk more involved in chicken keeping in the Western world. We were talking about this before. The chickens were selling for so much money. Breeding pairs of Brahmas and Cochins were selling over $100 a piece. Which at that time, in the was, mid-1800s, that's was a, a lot. That's a lot of money. Thousands of dollars now. Yeah. yeah. So essentially, what came out of hen fever, more men got involved in this hobby. It was almost always a middle and upper class hobby. This is where the British Poultry Club and the American Poultry Association grew out of. It's where the breed standard came in. So you sort of took chickens from this everyday woman's sphere and you elevated them into this exhibition thing. Exactly. To the chicken show, basically like the dog show, showing them off for their different breed characteristics. Women were involved in this too, but this is one of the things that got men more involved with chickens. Women wanted to have the little bantams walk down the street and kind of show them off. These are my lovelies. Did they walk down the street with a bantam? Yes. This in my mind, this has happened. Okay. (laughs) Okay. I'm seeing a lady with a long dress on, holding a little bantam. I mean, I'm to fine with that. Show. I love that picture, but yes. They were prestigious. That's I think that's picture. where the first chicken shows came from. They wanted to show them off. Oh, I'm sure. And it was a good way to network to buy for other hobby breeders, etc. This is definitely what the chicken show grew out of. Oh, yeah. So fast forward a little bit more. And men took over the chicken sector in an even bigger way after the First and Second World Wars. Because then... Food security came in. Exactly. So if you listen to episode 30, when we talk about the brown shaver chicken, Mm -hmm. men like Donald Shaver, who bred the brown shaver, he came home from Europe where he saw starvation and abject poverty. And he came back with this desire to make food more readily available to the average person. So what happened is that out of this grew the hybrid laying hen and the commercial broiler chicken, both of those. Quick sources of protein that were reasonably affordable. Exactly. 
And if you want to hear more about this, our Patreon episode last month talks a lot about this in mid-century chicken keeping. Exactly right, right. We really get into the historical patterns and what happened there. But essentially, the chicken was taken from the backyard sphere and it was industrialized. Exactly. I mean, these men had the best of intentions, getting food to people. That's what their intentions were. That's what their intentions were. In the beginning. <laughs> right. Everything happens for a reason. That reason sometimes we don't always know. Right. I don't know that the early farms had things like the battery cages that hens are kept no. in now. And we know that the broilers were a lot different at we that point. We know that in the 40s, when my great-grandparents owned it, chickens ran around right. yeah. free. Yeah. They were not put in cages or anything like that. While North America and much of Europe were shifting to this industrial chicken farm model, right. we're going to take a quick peek in the rest of the world because women in India, Africa, and a lot of other areas were still continuing to foster chickens and other types of livestock. I think as this was going on in history, when men came in and said, okay, we need help with this, this, and this, and let's take the chicken, I think it was definitely still going on with women. It was. There's always been this love for chickens from women. So I found a really interesting paper. It was written in 2012, and it was written by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, and it's called Invisible Guardians. Okay. And it's all about women in Africa and Asia, and it found that they were doing the majority of the livestock care and production, and in the process, they were safeguarding the genetics of these indigenous rare breeds. Exactly. And then not necessarily with any great scientific knowledge behind it, but because those indigenous breeds worked for their regions, mm -hmm. not only were they keeping the heritage breeds alive, a lot of the women were engaged in selective breeding that focused on two very important factors, temperament and health and disease resistance. Which they're, to me, the most important. They really are. And so these women were being very practical. They loved the heritage breeds that were local to their area. Which makes sense. If a bird is regional, it's going to do the best in the region where it That's is. Where it it all makes sense. It does that that's what they were doing. And let's put it this way. Women rock. <laughs> yes. Essentially, they were doing very important preservation right. work without a lot of scientific know-how behind it. They were just Instinct. doing what they believe. Exactly. Right. So I have a link to that United Nations paper in the right. show notes. And I also have a link to this. It's a short YouTube video, and it was produced by the International Livestock Research Institute. Okay. And it features African women smallholders who talk about raising chickens. It sounds like their small holdings were repopulated with chickens. The chickens helped provide income, especially egg sales. And some of the women, this was interesting to me, had just fallen in love with them. And they referred to the hens as their daughters. It's, so the hens came to them as part of a commercial enterprise to repopulate their small holdings. But they love them. It all makes so total sense to me because women are creatures of emotion. And the chicken has an immense amount of emotion. Chickens are just magic, too. They, just, are. they are. And I always say this. Someone picks up a chicken that never has done it before, it's written on their face. Yeah. yeah. They're instantly happy. Mm -hmm. And women, that makes them feel good. They're kind of like caregivers by genetic nature. Right. And these chickens eat that up well, and they yeah. give back something. Right. It's a perfect match. In a lot of ways, it really is. It really is. And emotionally, they give back. Women are hardwired, if we believe psychologists and other doctors, women are hardwired to be cooperators. Yeah. And a chicken flock is kind of the same way. Totally. I little... mean, they'll eat each other if they're given a chance. We're also <laughs> hardwired to be caretakers. Uh-huh. I look at Sophia and Ella when they were tiny babies or even magpie right now. They instantly go to holding a baby doll, to nurturing. Uh -huh. And that's what it takes. And that's all through history. These chickens take nurturing and love, but they give back. It's a perfect match. They absolutely do give back. So I thought that paper and that short video were really interesting. Yeah. The women's faces just light up when they talk about the chickens. And they're speaking in different African dialects, but there are subtitles, very easy to read. Yeah. It's a nice little video if you want to check it out. The one thing that's good, too, is the chicken is giving you the food source and you don't have to take the chickens. Right. You can use the chicken as a dual purpose animal. Or you can just use the chicken for eggs. Yeah. It's just a perfect match. It doesn't surprise me at all through history that women have taken care of these birds. There's this really fantastic book called Literary Chickens. Okay. And it's sort of a coffee table book, but really it's taking quotes out of a lot of great literature about mm -hmm. chickens. And not all of it, but a large part of it. It's the relationship with women and their chickens. And I don't know if you read this in high school because we were in different English classes in our senior year. Did you ever read Pride Prejudice, Jane yeah, Austen? I did, yeah. It was so long ago, though. Yeah. So I don't know if you remember that Elizabeth Bennett's <laughs> best friend is Charlotte Lucas. That was a tongue twister. 
Charlotte Lucas ends up marrying this minister who's kind of a buffoon. Everyone makes right. fun of him. But Jane Austen points out in the text that Charlotte's happy because she has her own house and her own poultry. Yeah. She can deal with her buffoonish husband because she has her birds. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So now we're kind of, kind of full circle. Right. COVID-19. COVID-19 hit and people scrambled to find chickens, mostly to give themselves a bit of food security. Yeah. Some people, because they were home, they'd always wanted chickens. And it was a perfect time for these women who always wanted to be chicken ladies. Right. Who never thought they could. Right. Some people did get chickens to make extra money. And many of these people ended up falling in love with their chickens and wondering how they ever lived without them. This is how we want to see it all turn out. We want to make sure that everyone who got chickens during COVID is going to keep them and take care of them. And usually they will. I mean, how can you not fall in love with these chickens? I was in love with chickens before I even got them. I just talked at the beginning of the episode about wheeling Gertie around the neighborhood in a stroller. So I, you know what I mean? I don't even blink twice about that. I would think nothing about my neighbor going by with a chicken in a stroller. I just wave and people yeah. look at me like, there's a crazy chicken lady. But hey, when they needed eggs during COVID, uh -huh. my neighbors were here. Where they come for, yeah. Yep. I think you need to spend some time with a chicken and experience the magic. And then you understand the chicken uh, in the stroller. Yeah. I tell you. I've seen this so many times because people come and they visit us. They want to hold a chicken. And first of all, they're like, they're going to be mean. They're going to bite me. And I'm like, no, I have two chickens that bite. <laughs> Gertie, before she was sick, could yeah. be a little feisty. Yeah. You know, and I kind of love that about her. I know? like a feisty chicken. So, I mean, hey, it happens. Some people that are friends or family that have never been around chickens. Uh-huh. And you explain to them, think about a dog. Right. They're kind of like that. Yeah. Yeah. In and a lot of ways. And then when they hold the chickens and you take the picture, it's all in the picture. Yeah. Faces it's just happiness. Uh -huh. I mean, who wouldn't want to be a crazy chicken lady? Chicken lady in history, we've always said this. It's a real deal thing. The history is right there. Let's just keep it going. And so that was just a quick, fun little overview showing how it changed. So you have this long continuum of chicken lady. And then two world wars hit that really changed things, modernized, industrialized the world. And now we are swinging back the other way. I don't think we can stop history. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy chicken lady it is. Okay, so I think it's time to go on to ch -ch 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 cracking some eggs. Crack those eggs. So we are back in Italy, but we're doing a fun recipe. I love this one. It's poached eggs and tomato sauce. The Italian name, which I'm not going to attempt, translates to eggs in purgatory. And haven't we all heard purgatory? Well, we grew up that. Catholic, so we've heard yes. purgatory ad nauseum. You don't want to end up in purgatory. <laughs> right. So these are eggs in purgatory. And again, they're just poached eggs in tomato sauce. You can't go wrong with it. No, them. no. It's super easy. There are versions of this in other cultures and other countries. And most of them call for a spicy addition to the sauce, like cayenne pepper, crushed red pepper flakes, etc. Chipotle. Yeah, peppers. you and I definitely prefer ours on the mild side. Definitely. So I these, am not a spicy, me like either. spicy foods. Me either. So ours are eggs in heaven, I guess, because we're not doing eggs in purgatory. <laughs> no. <laughs> so <laughs> ours are a little milder. And we kept this super easy. Yeah. And we love this because you can build on it. So we just use simple marinara sauce from a jar. If you want to go all out and make homemade sauce, it'll probably be amazing. Yeah. If you've grown some Roma tomatoes and you want to process them. The other thing you can do if you buy purchased sauce is you can add veggies to it to beef it up. I love zucchini in my sauce. Me too. Zucchini and carrots. I love to roast them first uh -huh. and then just toss them in the sauce. Delicious. I've done sauce both ways. And sometimes life happens. You just need to buy the jar of sauce. Exactly. And it's quick. And it works for any meal. It works. You empty it in a saucepan. So, yeah. So let's break it down how the recipe works. You put your sauce and any of your fancy additions into a saucepan or a right. wide skillet. If you use a saucepan, you can't fit as many eggs in it. Right. A wider skillet, you're obviously going to be able to get more it eggs in there. has to be deeper, though. Yeah, it does. Bring that to a simmer, as you said. One by one, you're going to crack your eggs into a small bowl or a cup. Right. And carefully tip them into the simmering sauce. Mm -hmm. You cover it. If you have a big skillet without a cover, you can take a sheet of aluminum foil yeah. and put that over. That works. You're going to cover and simmer for like three to five minutes, mm -hmm. basically until the eggs are cooked to your liking. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, the yolk is left pretty runny. I am not a fan of a runny I know. Yolk. I love it, but I know you We're don't. We're opposites on that. We are, yeah. We're opposites on a lot of things. 
but we match. Yeah, it works. We're, we're opposites on some stuff that doesn't matter. And then on core stuff, we're the same. I always say we have all the things in the world in common. We just come to them from different directions. Which is actually fun. Yeah, it's good. So anyway, my yoke is runny. Your yoke is firmer. Yeah. And again, no one's going to stop you from cooking this more. If you want to cook your egg more, you can't. like, cook it till it's hard. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> and what we've read, it looks like this is usually served in a bowl mm-hmm. with like a thick rustic bread or garlic toast on the bottom of the bowl, mm-hmm. like one of those big shallow pasta mm-hmm. bowls. And then you pour the sauce and the eggs over. Sounds amazing. It sounds amazing. I tried it over gluten-free pasta. Uh, what did I use? Fusilli. Delicious. You could also serve it over polenta. You could just buy a loaf of Italian bread if you wanted to. Cut it thickly. You could either toast it or not. Oh, yeah. It would be really good. The sauce and eggs over that. Man, that's making me hungry. That sounds so good. I know. So that is our eggs poached in tomato sauce or eggs in purgatory. So it's time for retail therapy. Retail therapy. Yeah. Yeah. So this week we have a treat for everybody. We are going to do a retail therapy on an Etsy store owned by Julie Hammond, who is a watercolor artist. We ran into Julie on Instagram, and she really, really loved our picture of Iris in the basket (laughs) on the Huffy bike. Uh So she reached out, and we were chatting via Instagram, and her stuff is so cute and so pretty that we decided to give her retail therapy. Julie's a watercolor artist, so her shop is filled with watercolor work. And there are chickens. There are chickens, yeah. She has mostly animals. She has some mushrooms and some other really cute stuff. And looks like she has a fall line that's out now. Yeah. And she did send us some cards, and one of which had the bat, which is really cute. Yeah, that's one of her Halloween cards. It's super cute. She said she really loves painting animals, especially ones with interesting details like feathers. Yes. Or hair patterns, colors, that sort of thing. She was telling me on Instagram that she had a dream about owning a chicken and then had to paint the chicken. Isn't that, that funny? she was dreaming of. She's always wanted to have chickens. So until she can have a little mini farm, she wants to paint them. Oh, that's really great. I love that. To kind of keep it going. She said she went to school to be a children's illustrator. That's awesome. Which is fantastic. And she has started a couple of art-based businesses. One of them was hand-painted cookies. And that's not easy. No, that is not easy at all. That's a lot, a lot of work. It is. And she said basically that her youngest just graduated from high school and she didn't know where she was going to take her business. Uh So she turned to her creative side and her watercolors and she's putting them out for everybody to purchase. She has a new line of stickers and there's a chicken sticker. Yeah, the stickers are cute. They're usually about $5 a piece. They're good size stickers. Yeah. The chicken one's adorable. It's very watercolor style. I love it. And stickers are hot right now. Uh The kids love big stickers for their notebooks, for their stuff for school. Yep. This is a place to look for something. The mushrooms are really cute. She has a big bee sticker that's really cute. She does a custom watercolor of your house. That's really cool. That's really cool. So you would send a picture to her, I would guess, and then she would paint it in watercolor and send it back to you. I'm going to send her one of my house once my gardens are put in. Oh, yeah. I would love that idea. Julie, it's coming. It's coming, Julie. So we asked Julie what her favorite thing in her Etsy shop was. Yeah. And she said right now she's most proud of her Halloween garland. Yeah. There's an owl, a bat, and a ghost and jack-o'-lanterns. It is adorable, especially if you're big into Halloween. Oh, yeah. And basically we asked her, since she said she really wants to have chickens, what breeds she would want to have in the future. And she told us she wanted to have Easter Eggers, Phantom Silkies, and the Belgium Duclay. Can't go wrong. Nope, you can't go wrong with that. I love all of them, but the Duclé really resonates with me. And I she, love those little bearded chickens. Yeah, she says, I'd love to have a chicken sit on my lap while I paint. Is that weird? No. No. <laughs> no. That is not weird. It's perfectly normal in this universe. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> we asked her about upcoming projects, and she says for the fall, she has her Halloween line now. Uh-huh. But she said for everyone to look out for Christmas. Great. She does a lot of greeting cards. I'm going to be looking for Christmas cards on this shop. Oh, yeah. They're so pretty. Hand done. It's personal. Mm -hmm. There's a pig card and a calf card that are beyond cute. Yeah. Yeah. All of them are adorable. I mean, I love that chicken. Julie's shop is called Living in the Lovelies. Again, it's on Etsy. We will have it linked in our show notes. Yes. Go over and check it out. The mushrooms. I just love the mushrooms. Everything is so cute. And she's a very talented artist. Oh, you know, I mentioned the home watercolor. She also does a custom pet portrait watercolor. Ooh, chicken. Yeah, you could. You could have her custom paint your chicken. Yeah, that would be really neat. 
So she's on Etsy, living in the lovelies. Uh Uh-huh. Go over and check her out. She's got great stuff. So should we tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next week? Next week, we are going to be spotlighting the absolutely beautiful Phoenix I cannot wait. Our main topic is starting a small poultry hatchery. We're going to be talking with Northwoods Poultry. It's going to be so much fun. And our recipe is sheet pan eggs. One sheet and a meal. You can't go wrong with that. Fantastic. So, So, what should we tell everybody to do until then? Hug your chicken every day. And kiss them too. Don't forget. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening.